Guys, I have to say that um, this channel is all about serious, usually sports-related topics, which are completely based on our perfectly normal, logical way of thinking, and of course backed up by our scientific research. We are hoping for a steady, progressive growth in our audience, which is hopefully attracted to our content by, like I previously mentioned, our perfectly normal, sane way of thinking. However, today, we are going to go down the rabbit hole of Rafael Nadal's shocking 2013 Round 1 Wimbledon loss to Steve Garcis, and we are going to come up. We are going to come up with some evidence for our conspiracy theory. So the first thing that you're most likely going to say to me is somewhere in the ballpark of, wait, Sebastian, why the hell are you talking about Nadal and 2013 and grass? Like, don't you know that post-2012, Nadal is just not the same player on grass that he used to be? He's losing to career journeymen such as Lucas Russell, Dustin Brown, Jill Miller, 19-year-old Nick Kyrgios. Like, why the hell would Steve Darcy's be different? What are you talking about? Well, it's not as simple as you may think. Rafael Nadal actually has three different grass carriers merged into one, basically. With the first and the third part being actually really similar, and the third being a complete outlier. And the Steve Darcy's match did happen in the middle part of his career, which is the complete outlier, and we are going to focus on that a little bit later in this video. But first of all, let's break down the first and the third part. Now, a lot of you may not know this, but his actual Grand Slam debut happened at the 2003 Wimbledon, and it was really, really really impressive considering the fact that he beat Mario Ancic in four sets in his first match at Grand Slams ever, the same Mario Ancic who happens to be the last guy to defeat Roger Federer at Wimbledon until Rafael Nadal did it himself in 2008, so that is mighty impressive. Now he did end up losing in the third round to a gentleman from Thailand, and I will absolutely butcher his name, Paradorn Shrichapan. His nickname is Ball. So he did end up losing to Ball in the third round of the 2005 Wimbledon, but overall it was a really impressive performance considering it was his first ever major and he was only 17 years old. So he did not play at the 2004 Wimbledon because of a knee injury that he sustained during the clay court season. He actually ended up skipping both Roland Garros and Wimbledon. And in 2005, he ended up losing in the second round in four sets to Jill Miller out of all people, the same guy who beat him in 2017. So Jill Miller, I guess he just owns him at Wimbledon. He is one of the three guys ever to beat Rafael Nadal twice at Wimbledon. And the other two are, of course, Novak Djokovic and Roger Federer. So... I guess Jill Miller is just that guy. Now, in 2006, he most likely did feel like Gucci Mane because he ended up making the Wimbledon finals for the first time ever in his career. Now, he ended up losing to Roger Federer in four sets, but that was pre Federer and only 21-year-old Rafael Nadal. In 2007, he won a set more than in 2006 versus Roger Federer, but still, unfortunately for him, came up short in the final, losing three sets to two. And we all know what happened in 2008, a epic final winning the fifth set 9-6 after multiple rain delays. He ended up skipping the 2009 edition because of an injury, and in 2010 he came back and defeated Thomas Burdick in the final. In 2011, he was on a 20-match winning streak at Wimbledon, and he did run into a peak Novak Djokovic who beat him in four sets, but it was still an impressive performance considering the fact that he beat Andy Murray, for example, in the semi-final. So let's go to the third part of Rafael Nadal's career on grass, which is 2017 to the present day, basically. Now, a lot of you may think that Rafael Nadal still sucks in this period, like he's not having any good results on grass. But I disagree with you, actually, and let's break it down. Now, of course, in 2017, Rafael Nadal came back from a dreadful period of time when it comes to results compared to his standards, of course. He was barely a top 10 player in 2015 and 2016. He didn't win the French Open, and he was struggling with form, struggling with injuries, and so on. Now, in 2017, he came back, dominated the clay court swing, and uh, ended up actually losing to Jill Miller again at Wimbledon. I guess it happens. In 2018, he made it to the semi-final for the first time since 2011 and ended up losing to Novak Djokovic in five sets, two days, a curfew delay because Isner and Anderson decided to play 26-24 in the fifth set 
and that's why the rules are actually changed. As I mentioned, it was in five sets. It was really tight. Rafael Nadal was a couple of points away from winning that match. He had a huge opportunity at 7-all in the fifth set, but um, that didn't really end up going well for him. Now, in 2019, he was unfortunate to run into a inform Roger Federer in the semifinal. He ended up losing to him in four sets. And I know that a lot of people criticize Roger Federer for that 40-15 thing, but you forget how good Roger Federer was actually playing on that tournament. Like, Matteo Berrettini won five games on grass versus Roger Federer. I don't care how inexperienced or young or whatever Matteo Berrettini was. Like, he still had a good serve. I mean, five games? Really? Um, yeah, Roger Federer was really good that year. He was one point away from winning major number 21. And that was a totally excusable loss when it comes to Rafael Nadal. Now, of course, the 2020 edition wasn't held because of the COVID thing. Uh, in 2021, he ended up skipping Wimbledon because of an injury. And in 2022, his progress was halted again in the semifinal round. This time, he couldn't even make the court versus Nick Kyrgios because he got injured versus Taylor Fritz in the quarterfinal, which he ended up winning actually in five tight sets. And of course, in 2023, he did not play in tournament. So if you take the first and the third part of his grass career, it's actually really similar in my opinion. Now, of course, in the first part, he's a teen prodigy and he cannot be a teen prodigy in his mid-30s, but it's really similar. There is a random Jill Miller loss, then there is losing to Roger Federer and Novak Djokovic, which is totally acceptable in my opinion. There is actually winning two tournaments in the first part, which is, again, really great and acceptable. And then there is skipping the tournament because of injuries. Now let's break down the second part of his grass career, which is obviously not that great. Now the first thing we need to do is kind of ignore the 2015-2016 stretch of results. And this is the thing that I kind of do with Novak when I break him down. I ignore the 2017 midpoint 2018 season because... That's just not Novak in 2015-2016, Nadal is just not Nadal, like he's not a good player. And it's not difficult to ignore that part of his grass career because in 2016 he actually skipped the tournament. And in 2015 he lost to Dustin Brown, another guy who just kind of owns him on grass. It is what it is, it happens. At the 2012 Wimbledon, as you know, Rafael Nadal ended up losing to Lucas Russell in the second round. To be perfectly fair to Lucas Schrossel, he was mighty impressive, he was smacking the shit out of that ball and he deserved that victory, but then again, Rafael Nadal was, at the end of the day, injured, he did not play a single match until the 2013 season, so I guess you can say he wasn't 100% and he wasn't even on the Rafael Nadal, I will tolerate the pain percentage of being ready. So a similar thing happened at the 2014 Wimbledon. He ended up losing to a teenage prodigy Nick Kyrgios in the fourth round, three sets to one. But in a way, it was actually much more severe than 2012. Because 2012, okay, he got injured, he missed six months, but he came back, he was better than ever. In 2014, he actually tried to come back that year, but he failed, and 2015 absolutely sucked. And 2016 also absolutely sucked. So it was really, really a poor period of time, and it all started at Wimbledon 2014, so I think we can excuse Rafael Nadal for that loss, too. So what exactly happened in 2013? Was he injured? Completely out of form? Like, what's going on here? Well, it's kind of interesting to know that, yes, Rafael Nadal did limp in the third set versus Steve Darcy's. But Steve Darcy's ended up withdrawing before the second round matchup versus Lukas Kubot. So who was actually injured there? What's also interesting to note is that Rafael Nadal was in a really good form, actually. And I'm not just talking about the pre-Wimbledon form, because of course there's the clay season, and Rafael Nadal did end up having a 22-match winning streak after losing the Monaco final to Novak Djokovic. He won Barcelona, Madrid, Rome, and Roland Garros back-to-back. -back. But... After the Wimbledon final, the Wimbledon loss to Steve Darcy's is actually perfectly sandwiched in between two 22 match winning streaks. Because after the Wimbledon, he ended up winning Canada, Cincinnati, US Open, and then his first loss came in Beijing in October. So Nadal was somehow on the peak of peaks prior and after the Wimbledon loss to Steve Darcy's. He was 44-0 versus guys ranked between 1 and 134. And then he is 0-1 versus a player ranked 135.
Interesting. So let's check on his opponent. Who's actually Steve Darcy? Was he some kind of a prodigy? Like, was he in the form of his life? What's going on? Well, in 2013, Steve Darcy was 5 and 7 on the ATP Tour. During his whole career, he was 118 and 134 on the ATP Tour. He has two career titles, one in 2007 and 2008. Okay. He was ranked world number 135 going into the match, and he ended the year being number 164, which was his worst ranking since 2006, and worst ranking until 2020, the year in which he basically retired. Hmm. Even on challengers, he was doing poorly that year. Only 12 and 9 on challengers. Let's check him versus the other members of Big 3. Maybe he has some type of game to beat them. Oh, he played... Federer once, it was 6-1, 6-2, 6-1. He played Novak three times, got bageled twice. He played Nadal once more, and he lost 6-1 to nothing before retiring. Hmm. I don't know, maybe Grass is his favorite surface? Oh, wait. Grass is his, statistically speaking, worst surface. He never made past the second round of Wimbledon. Hmm. Wait, 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 Sebastian, what the hell are you talking about, man? Are you are you actually, are you really saying that Nadal lost that match on purpose? Is that what you're trying to say? Well, let me explain. So my conspiracy theory that I made up uh, 15 minutes ago actually is backed up by two things. The first of which is, I think, a well-accepted, well-known fact, even amongst Nadal fans, is that he absolutely despises losing, and it really affects his confidence. Especially when losing to guys who are not, like, in the upper echelon of tennis, like, not in the top five or something like that. He absolutely hates losing, and it really affects his confidence. He really affects the way he plays. And I think he had a bit of PTSD from the 2012 Wimbledon going into the 2013 edition. He had a bit of PTSD from Lucas Russell, and he thought to himself, well, I'm, I'm back. I had that nasty injury in 2012. I'm back. I just won the French Open. I'm on a 22-match winning streak. I don't want to lose a competitive match against somebody like, I don't know, Thomas Burdick, Joe Wilfred Songa, somebody like that, in which I know that I'm trying 100% and I'm still losing because that will really affect my form going into the summer American swing. And guess what? I think he chose the easy way out. He said, okay, man, like, let me just lose to this random guy. I know that I can beat him. I know that he's an absolute nobody. And I can actually train more for the American summer hardcore swing. And guess what happened? He won all three major tournaments. And the second one is, well, listen, guys, we always talk about Rafael Nadal as this ultimate opportunist, Walter, who will find the Grand Slam that is up in the air to be won, and he's going to win it. Like, he's going to find that Grand Slam, and he's going to win it. Well, this was the exact opposite of Walshering a Grand Slam, because Rafael Nadal's draw was absolutely horrific. Now, if you don't remember, Rafael Nadal going into the tournament was still ranked as number 5 because he skipped the basically the second half of 2012, and he didn't participate in 2013 Australian Open. So he was his ranking was actually really, really poor. He was behind David Ferrer on the list. And of course, as the number five guy, you will, well, always have the unfortunate fate of having to face somebody from the top four in the quarterfinals. And that somebody from the top four in the quarterfinals was projected to be none other than um, Roger Federer. Yeah, it was a really tough draw for Rafael Nadal. And then on top of that, in the semifinals, he was projected to face, if somehow he beats Roger Federer, he was projected to face none other than Andy Murray. And yes, I know that Andy Murray had a bad head-to-head -head record versus Rafael Nadal on grass. But listen, nobody, nobody was as hungry as Andy Murray when it comes to winning the Wimbledon in 2013. Like, Andy Murray was ready to die for that Wimbledon, and Andy Murray was in great form. He was the 2012 Wimbledon finalist. He absolutely destroyed Roger Federer at the 2012 Olympics a month later, basically, and he was ready to go. And yes, Andy Murray had some injury concerns in 2013. He skipped parts of the clay season, but he won Queens. He was ready to go. And then, on top of that, if somehow Rafael Nadal would have gotten past Roger Federer, if somehow he would have gotten past Andy Murray, Novak Djokovic, of course, in the finals, good luck. So I think, I think Rafael Nadal, smart dude. 
Yeah. But you need an even smarter dude to figure him out.